Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Leading Through Change Cybersecurity Digital Event, hosted by the CMI North East Yorkshire and Humberside Board. My name's Claire, one of the event managers at CMI. I'll be shortly handing over to Kirsty Watson, our regional stakeholder lead um, at the North East Yorkshire and Humberside, to begin today's event with our guest speaker, Erin Yates from Radar. Um, if you have any questions during the session, you can ask them during the in the live chat to the right of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we can today in the Q&A. Today's event is being recorded and we'll be shared with you uh, following the event for those who book to attend. And the recording will also be available on the CMI website and YouTube channel. Now over to Kirsty to begin today's event. Hi. Thank you for joining us today. So today we're going to talk about cybersecurity and we're going to just touch upon some key pra best practices and guidance for yourselves and your businesses. So over the last few years, the world of work and business has been catapulted into working online. So the use of remote communication apps such as Teams, Zoom, GoToMeeting and even some of the Google tools has become common practice for us all. We've moved, or more been pushed, away from the traditional paper-based systems, face-to-face -face systems, and while this has been growing naturally in the background um, prior to COVID, as a result of COVID, we've had to take the lead and move much faster and change things straight away. So today, and also in the second event, which we'll be doing on the 19th of October, again between 12 and 1, we're going to be looking at how we can do this as safe as possible. Now, how we'll be looking at how we can mitigate the risks whilst remaining operationally functional as best as we can do. We're going to be joined by Aaron Yates of Radar. He's the head of product, uh, who will be presenting some key best practice guidance on cybersecurity and also answering some questions in our live Q&A. Feel free to leave any of your questions and we will pick up on them and we will answer them as best as we can do. And if we don't collect them today and pick up on them, we may look at them on the 19th as well. So do feel free to, to keep handing them over. So now I'm going to hand you over to Erin, who is going to do the presentation. Hi, Erin. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Kirsty. Over to me. Yes, it's over to yourself. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very excited to be here. Um, I believe we've got quite a few of you joining us today. So without further ado, I will um, I'll jump in. Just a, a quick bit of background for you. Uh, Radar is a uh, leading law firm uh, based in Hull. Uh, the, uh, you might have heard of us through our partnership with AXA Insurance, uh, where we are the creator of their management liability uh, insurance policy uh, and its associated risk management services, which is distributed by 1,500 insurance brokers across the UK. Uh, primarily through our specialist legal expertise, we help businesses reduce the likelihood of disruption. So today, what I'll be talking to you about is how we do that through cyber. So let's talk about cyber. To cover, uh, to, to start, what are we going to cover? We're going to be looking at, uh, well, why are we here? Um, is cyber really a problem? Uh, and actually, what, what exactly is that problem when we use the word cyber? Uh, and what can we do about it? So I'm going to try and cover off all of the background knowledge for why, of the, why many of the problems that we see, that we hear about in the press, actually exist. So, is it really a problem? Here's a few quick news articles uh, over the last uh, couple of years, certainly. Um, uh, one incident, a ransomware attack forces uh, an Arkansas CEO to fire 300 employees days before Christmas. Uh, an incident where the Solicitors Regulation Authority shut down a Phoenix firm, a, a law firm, on, also on Christmas Eve, uh, following their suffering of a cyber attack. And I'm sure many of you will be aware, prior to the pandemic, TravelX being hit, resulting in the stopping of their services and ultimately that business having major difficulties. So we are aware that things are happening. This word cyber is regularly being used, resulting in business issues. Uh, I appreciate that some of these are a couple of years old. So actually, let's have a look at one from yesterday. Uh, some of you may have heard of this incident. Uh, uh, firm called Giant Pay confirms it was hit by a sophisticated cyber attack. And you might be asking the question with some of these, well, is this really applicable to me? How are these 
uh, large-scale cyber attacks having an influence on my life. What you might not be aware, uh, in, if you're living in the UK at the moment, you're certainly uh, aware of the, the petrol and diesel crisis that we're having. But many truck drivers are actually self-employed. And through that self-employment, they're actually managed, that umbrella service is managed by giant pay. So there are many truck drivers at the moment that are now struggling to get paid due to a cyber attack on the, the, the organization that actually provides their, their payroll, that runs payroll for them. Um, and a number of truck drivers have potentially, uh, I believe as I've seen it stated, um, are actually saying they're not going into work because they haven't been paid, which is further exacerbating the crisis that we're sitting in. So what we can definitively say is there is a problem happening. With this, this issue of cyber isn't theoretical, it is, it is real, it's, these incidents are happening. So how can we make this real? Um, and what I'm actually going to do now is I'm going to take you through a few tests. I'm going to try and make this real for you as human beings. So let's do the first one. Uh, I appreciate you're either sat at home or in the office at the moment, and hopefully you may have a second screen or you're using a browser and you'll be able to hear me talking if you open up a new tab. What I'd like you to do is go to the website listed there, uh, securityheaders.io. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a minute to go and do this. You can type in uh, in Google or Microsoft Edge or Firefox, whichever browser you're using. You can even use your mobile phone if it's easier than opening a new tab. Go to securityheaders.io and type in your company's website address. So I'm just going to give everyone a few moments to do this. And whilst you're doing that, I'll just talk you through what's actually happening. So this website is a free service and it is running a number of checks freely against your website to give you a grade, a score between A star and U. U is unrated, it, um, the, the lowest score you can get is an F. If it's lower than an F, you get a, a U, which is really not a great place to be. Uh, but it'll give you a score between A star and F. If you are doing this, if you could pop into the chat window for me and just let me know what type of scores you're seeing, I'll be very grateful, just so I can see that some of you are following along. No comments as yet. I, I hope I hope some of you are giving the free test to go. Oh, an F. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's not great. Um, I hope some of you are going through this. Um, so. Just a quick test, it's just checking your website, um, which may have been built by a marketing agency, it may have been built internally. Um, oh, someone's got an A, that's phenomenal. Uh, someone's got a C. Yeah, the, there's going to be a variety of scores here. So uh, I'll come back to why we're doing this in a second, but just a quick test for you to see whether or not your website has some commonly easily detectable security vulnerabilities. So let's jump on to the next test. Is your iPhone secure? Um, so if you have an iPhone, my apologies, this isn't a, um, uh, applicable to, to Android, but if you're using an iPhone, uh, if you could open that for me and go to settings, you go to the settings app, it's got the, the cog on it. Once you're in settings, you can scroll down, depending on the age of your phone, it'll be called one of three things. It could be touch ID and passcode or face ID and passcode, or it might just be passcode if it's a, a, a much older model. But if you can go in there for me and then scroll all the way to the bottom and you'll see a setting, a toggle box uh, that will say erase data. It won't do anything. It's just a toggle box. And that setting will either be green or it will be gray. So just a quick test again. If you do have an iPhone and you can check this for me, just a quick comment in, in the comments as to whether or not it's green or gray. Uh, And just let me know how you're getting on there. I just want to see, uh, in this case, green is good, gray is bad. Uh, I just want to, to see how many are greens and grays. Someone's saying gray. Gray. Another gray. Okay, thank you for taking the time to do that. What I'm just checking here is whether or not a security setting on your phone, a few more greys coming through, um, if, if a security setting that is available to you is used, which it, it's not. Um, I'll, again, I'm going to come back to why in a second. So let's have a look at the next one. Another website, please, if you could visit for me, again, either on your computer, if you have a spare screen, or on your mobile. 
So the website address, oh, there's, there's a uh, gentleman asking, should I make it green? Uh, yes, I, I will come back to that for you. Um, but on, on this next test for you very quickly, this is the last one of three very quick tests. There's a website address, uh, have I been, the, the next word there is pronounced owned, have I been owned.com spelled with the letter P. Uh, so if you can go there, it's going to ask you to put in your email addresses and all it's going to do is search whether or not your uh, personal information has been published online anywhere. So you can either put in, uh, if you've been with your employer for less than two years, try using a personal email address. If you've been with your current employer or had your own business for uh, more than two years, try using your, your work email address. Uh, and when, once you click submit, it will either come up with a green background indicating that potentially you are okay, or a red background indicating that you have <laughs> Correct, Sarah. Um, uh, or it will come up with a red background indicating that your details have been compri uh, comprised anywhere online. So again, if you could do that for me quickly and just let me know. Uh, there's a no there, resounding no from Simon. Uh, Simon, try another email address if you have many. It's always worth checking. Uh, and if anyone else could comment just whether or not you've been exposed anywhere. Green, okay. There's not usually many greens these days. Chris saying red, unfortunately, increasingly common. Okay, so we've got a few of those coming through. Oh, Andrew, 40 days breaches, that's terrifying. So let me jump on for you. So. What has just happened? So we've very quickly evidenced that your organization has at least some vulnerabilities uh, and we've made a very small part of the issue visible. Importantly, these insights are symptomatic of a far bigger problem. Uh, and I'd actually, I'd like to provide an analogy to this. Uh, you, you will all be familiar with leaving your house and going to the shop or going to work or once upon a time going on holiday, potentially somewhere in the sun. And when you leave your house, you probably glance back to make sure, did I lock the front door? Are all of my windows closed? Uh, is the side door closed? Is the garage door locked? So they're just the quick things that we do in our head to make sure that our property, our physical premises is secure. So these three tests are three very simple, very easy to do tests that are similar to those checks. Have you left the window open? Is the patio door open? Um, and these really are the, the equivalent. What you can see if your setting was gray instead of green, then there's a window open. If your website was scoring anything less than an A on those tests, there's a window left open. Uh, if your credentials, when you went to haveibeenown.com, were showing red, then there is a window left open. There are issues that we need to resolve. So three quick tests. So potentially what these indicate is that your organizations, if, if any of those were negative, uh, came back negative, that you could be exposed to a cyber incident. They could be exploited. So. What exactly is the problem? And, and this is where we need to start getting to, I suppose, the, the actual heart of the matter, the root cause here. So, some of you might be familiar with this lovely beige box that is now uh, on your screen. Um, some of you may have even worked with these back in the day. This was certainly one of my first computers. Um, these were much simpler times. Uh, if you worked with these, they would probably feel like much simpler times. Uh, computers were not portable. When we left the office at, at the end of the day, we could go home and the computer stayed on the desk. We didn't have a smartphone. Uh, we didn't have email at home. We went home and that was it. We could turn the computer off and work was done for the day. These devices were managed by IT managers and we used them for exactly what they were needed for. And they did a very small basic subset of tasks for us. Unfortunately, where we find ourselves now, I use the word, uh, unfortunately it's probably not the right word. Today is very different. Um, we have laptops, we have tablets, we have smartphones, we have desktop computers, we have servers, and all of these connect to cloud services. Um, for example, it might be Google Workspace or Xero for online bookkeeping or Office 365 for sharing various files or creating documents in the cloud. And there is a wealth of them. There are thousands, tens of thousands of cloud service providers that we can access from anywhere. So we could be on our smartphone, on a train, doing our bookkeeping, or we could be 
on a beach delivering a presentation on behalf of the CMI. I'm, I'm not sadly currently on a beach, but the potential exists that I could be. What's interesting about this is the rate of technological change. The device that I showed you previously was only 20, 25 years old. And now 25 years later, we have this, this world of machines. And actually, I'd like to compare this again. I used an analogy of your personal life in, in breaking into or looking at breaking into your own home if you've left the window open. Uh, but I imagine that many of you have a personal smartphone and that many of you actually have a, a personal email account. So I, I just want to do a, a quick show of hands in the chat again quickly. Um, so actually, I'm going to ask this question. Let's bring the window up. For those of you that have a personal smartphone, can you just quickly type yes if you have an iPhone or an Android device? Um, just a quick yes in the comments for me. Okay, great. Everyone's got a personal smartphone. So my next question is, do you have a personal email account? And just a quick yes again, do you have a personal email account? So all of you do. So one more question before I get onto the point of this. Did you add your personal email account to your personal smartphone? So when you bought your smartphone, you either uh, got it with your phone contract, you set the phone up, and you added your email to that. And that's most of you saying yes. I haven't seen any no's yet. So my next question following this is, uh, of all of you that are saying yes, are any of you qualified IT managers? There's going to be at least one or two yeses in this. So the, uh, the point I'm trying to make here is 25 years ago, we would have required a degree. Um, we would have required formal qualifications as an IT manager to link our smartphones to a cloud service device. What you've actually achieved in doing that 25 years ago was incredibly technologically complex. So bearing that in mind, what is there that potentially, and I don't know if you've asked yourself this question, what is there? that potentially you might have missed in joining those, in setting up your smartphone. We've looked at an iPhone and, and there were many settings that were great. That's a security setting that's been overlooked. An email account was set up, um, what security settings were overlooked. And then joining the two together, was that set up properly as well? I mean, are you potentially aware of what you may have missed? And the answer is probably no. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is technology has got so much easier to use that now you could actually do that. You could actually accomplish it, it is functional, it is working, it is doing what you need it to, but are you secure? And this starts the time with the problem that we're seeing for many businesses, certainly for smaller businesses. Technology is easier to use, it is more affordable, it is cheaper, we can spend 20 pounds a month on a cloud service, we can go to Argos and spend 300 pounds on a mobile phone. We can very quickly and easily acquire technology, but in configuring it, we are potentially not making all of the necessary settings or changes that are required to properly secure ourselves. Inevitably these days, it isn't the technology that fails. We don't hear about, um, there was a Samsung phone a few years back, but we don't hear uh, issues where the technology just collapses on us now. The, the, the phones don't just burst into flames. So the problem isn't the technology. We have rapidly changing and evolving technology and services, but the technology isn't the problem. So jumping on, why is this now such a problem? This is quite an important point to make as well. Um, certainly, we never heard our grandparents talking about cyber threats. Uh, and we found ourselves in a vicious cycle. Uh, we have increased competition demanding efficiency. So uh, a business uses technology to innovate, and that gives them efficiency, and that makes them more profitable. So our own businesses must further compete and diversify and create efficiency. And we are now in a rapidly escalating pace of constant technological evolution of increasing affordability, that we are consuming these technologies and these services to uh, simply compete in our industries and get dominated by. Um, Amazon, case in point, uh, the, the world's largest e-commerce business, the world's largest retailer, technically, um, in, is doing this. And that's driving many other businesses forward to have to compete and keep pace. So just to provide a little perspective here as well on this evolution, um, that perspective is the, the first flight computer in the space shuttle. I'm not sure if, if many of you um, realize that the first, uh, the flight computer in the first space shuttle had 1% of the memory of the Xbox 360 games console. And actually the Xbox 360 is now 15 years old and how much further along is technology than that? 
So just to give you a pace of this escalating curve of how things are rapidly improving. And what this is demanding is we are creating additional strata of technology within our businesses. In some cases, there may be systems or processes or computer devices themselves that are 10 or 15 years old that are running business critical processes. And we are laying new strata of business increasingly on top of those. So how can we be sure that those foundations aren't going to crumble underneath us or aren't creating exposures? And this actually ties in, though, there was a question submitted before we started the presentation today um, about change management. Um, and this is where change management comes into play. For businesses to change and keep pace, they need to be constantly looking backwards to factor in principles such as security by design and privacy by design, that when we are making changes, either for the better or replacing old infrastructure, that we are not introducing or we are removing vulnerabilities that, that we had. So keeping on this technology point for a second, my, um, my next slide for you is um, starting to dig a bit deeper. So uh, again, just a, a few quick questions in the chat. Um, have, has anyone uh, watching along ever sent an email after 10 p.m.? Just a quick yes or no, please. Great, yeah, thought so. And the next question is, uh, have you ever sent an email after maybe a glass of wine or a beer? I'm pretty sure we all have, yeah. Uh, last question on this line of questioning. Uh, don't worry, none of this, this bit gets recorded, so there's no admission of guilt. Um, have you ever sent an email to the wrong person? And I'm certainly guilty of that. So you probably, many of you are probably agreeing with me that we've, we've all done these things. Uh, and actually that, that ties in nicely here with my point that technology really isn't our problem. Um, so sending an email to the wrong person is the uh, primary means by which there is unauthorized disclosure of sensitive information to unauthorized individuals and um, to individuals to whom we did not mean to disclose it. So we can say that technology actually isn't the problem. Uh, actually, the problem is human beings keeping up with the technology that we have now. Therein lies the, the crux of most of our issues. So, on this point, what I'd like to do is take you through some of um, just a few scenarios that we can quickly build from to explain this point. Um, in information security terms, and I'm going to explain what I mean by information security in a few minutes, um, there is always some form of threat agent. Very rarely is that threat agent the technology itself. Uh, we don't have Skynet. This isn't the film Terminator yet, but that could change. Uh, but the threat agent is usually a, a human being of some sort. It could be a member of staff. It could be organized crime. It could be an opportunist, someone um, that is taking an opportunity that presents itself. It could be a category that we call script kiddies, hacktivists, hackers, or even a nation state. Um, and that threat agent, there will always, for the most part, be a, a motivation. Um, ordinarily, the motivation these days is typically financial gain, um, the individual's financial or group's financial gain. Uh, they will make use of a vector to exploit a vulnerability, and that will result in an instance for an organization. So that will either be financial loss or harm, increased costs of working, that will be uh, reputation damage, which is more likely to be the, the, um, the biggest uh, contender for your attention, uh, and or legal or regulatory. Um, uh, issues as well. So going through some of these, there's, uh, let's look at staff. Um, staff are the greatest threat vector that many businesses need to look at. Um, and there's many reasons, many motivations that where issues could happen. So with staff, many issues are accidental. If we look at uh, sending an email to the wrong person, many email services have uh, autocomplete. So when you are typing an individual's email address, it's very easy to start typing John Smith and actually uh, accidentally choose the wrong John Smith from the list. Uh, my apologies to any John Smiths that are following along, uh, and send an email to the wrong person with a spreadsheet containing information for the wrong uh, intended recipient. So the vector that's being used there is, is email, and the vulnerability is human. Um, it, at the best of times, pre-pandemic, we were all increasingly busy, and the working 24-7, or technology gave us the ability to work 24-7. We could send emails at 6 a.m. in the morning. Uh, but now in the, the pandemic, with remote working, with increased home working, agile working, uh, and the effects on human mental health, we're seeing the increased potential for the ability to make simple mistakes because we're living in um, just in very strange times. So accidents can happen. 
Another interesting sign um, uh, incident down the staff line is if we look at, um, it could be said to be accident, could be said to be negligence, uh, where there is a vector of what we call physical media. Uh, most of you will be familiar with USB keys, uh, little pen drives that you can plug into a USB port that you can share information with. Uh, technically, anything that is a USB port that can plug into your computer will have a, a microcontroller within it, some form of uh, ability to run code and identify itself. Um, some of you may even, uh, I imagine many of you will be familiar with the concept of vapes or e-cigarettes, and that those can be charged by USB cable. So there was actually an issue a couple of years ago where roughly 10 million e-cigarettes came over from China that were preloaded with malware, malicious software, so that uh, when individuals were going into the office, they were charging their e-cigarettes at work, they were actually transferring malicious software from their e-cigarette to their work laptop. And th there's two problems there, it depends on which way you want to look at it. Um, in an ideal world, the USB port should never have been available to those member of staff for that purpose. They should have been um, uh, are prevented from connecting it to use it for charging purposes and that can be done actually on the device itself and, and advised through policy and process do not use the laptop for this type of purpose uh, but similarly the member of staff should have known themselves uh, through training that do not plug unauthorized equipment into a work laptop and that was leading to to the transmission of malware so staff many issues uh, usually um, we start to uh, head into the realms of fraud here um, access to internal information that they shouldn't have access to, the, the intended benefit is financial, and there are many different ways that can happen. Usually, however, in the media, what you typically see represented outside of that category is the, these days organised crime. So you may have heard of topics such as social engineering or uh, phishing emails, which are a type of social engineering, or the spread of malware, malicious software, including ransomware. Um, so software, malicious software that installs itself on your, is installed on your computer, uh, that charges a ransom for you to get access back to your, your files. And typically this is run by organized crime groups and their motivation is and always will be financial. They are looking to make money and it is incredibly easy to make money through cybercrime at the moment. To give you an example, um, the some of you may have, have heard of a service called the dark web. Um, so a, a, a worldwide web inaccessible through normal web browsers, Chrome and the like, uh, but you can download software um, there's a piece of software called Tor, the Onion Relay, T-O-R. You can download and gain access to the dark web, these websites where you can buy um, guns, drugs, uh, people's elections, anything that you want to buy that's typically uh, potentially criminal, uh, you can buy through the dark web. And organized crime provide uh, services to each other through the dark web for uh, uh, actually facilitating further crime. So we're aware of a website that you can go to that um, criminals have begun to realize they can specialize in their own segments of provision of these services. So some very clever um, individuals have a website where they will provide you a service. You put in, let's say someone following along now, can build an Excel spreadsheet of first names, surnames, bank, uh, bank name, uh, mother's maiden name, any personal information you can gather, and you upload it to this criminal website. That website will send out emails on your behalf to your intended target loaded with malware, um, with the, uh, the transaction being that once the malware is installed on that individual's computer, uh, they will inevitably pay a ransom, and then the, that ransom will be shared between the service provider and you. So you bring the data, they provide the service, and together you can profit. So there actually does seem to be increasingly honor among thieves online, honor among criminals. So organized crime is getting increasingly clever. Next category, script kiddies, uh, just touching on these guys briefly. Um, interestingly, there's a number of statistics showing that incidents, uh, uh, usually uh, incidents that are uh, more annoyances than anything else, increase during the school holidays. Uh, you've all probably seen or experienced young people interacting with technology now. Uh, I have a three-year-old daughter that insists on hitting my TV screen at home because she thinks it's a touch screen. But kids are, we, we now have a digital native generation. Uh, there were many of us that grew up where technology has augmented us later in our lives, but for the most part now, young people are, are digital natives. They've fully grown up with technology as an extension of themselves. And because of that, what they are learning and what they're capable of learning through all of the information online is giving them the ability that they are going away and testing things in typical um, adolescent fashion by breaking them. So we're seeing script kiddies that are, and actually script kiddies were the main cause of the, the talk talk data breach a few years ago. Um, a group of um, uh, teenagers 
that identified a, a common vulnerability in a major corporation's website. And when I say a, a common vulnerability, I mean this vulnerability has been known about for years and would be addressed through compliance with a, a common uh, uh, specification for the building of websites. But these, these kids were able to go and find it. We also have, have hacktivists, which is increasingly common. Um, hacktivists, uh, obviously a portmanteau of, of hackers and activists. These groups predominantly are interested in spreading a message. Uh, at the moment, we have the uh, eco protesters on the M25, blocking the M25. Um, it's similar types of groups where there is website defacement or um, uh, the hacking of Twitter accounts to spread messages, uh, their own message, to try and get communication of their message out there to raise awareness. Usually, they are not um, truly malicious. They're not looking to make money. They are trying to, to spread a, a message, and they'll go to many lengths to try and do that. They're very different from the category, the next category down that we will call hackers, if we use this generic title. Um, hackers usually fall somewhere on an autistic spectrum. Uh, they are incredibly bright. They are uh, not ordinarily financially motivated. They're usually very clever in seeking to solve a problem. Um, that problem might be how to access the uh, defense infrastructure of a nation, but to them, that's just a, a challenge to overcome. Invariably, the best hackers inevitably once found will be made job offers by nation states, as my last category. Um, and the interplay between nation states is, is fascinating. Uh, uh, there's only some bits I can touch on this because I'm aware this, this presentation has been recorded, so I won't go into as much detail as I'd usually do with a, a, a bit more of a modicum of discretion. Um, however, I'm sure many of you are aware that nation states uh, sponsor many um, attacks. In fact, um, all nations now pretty much have uh, five domains of warfare, land, sea, airspace, um, and cyber, um, where uh, most nations have a proactive and a reactive defense mechanism. Uh, in the UK, our cybersecurity activities that we're mostly aware of are controlled by the National Cybersecurity Center, who issue guidance on how small businesses can, uh, can protect themselves. Worth touching on, on nation states just a little bit more. Um, uh, certainly within uh, the UK, um, a major issue that we have is protection of our infrastructure, but also of our intellectual property, as a vast amount of our GDP is derived from professional services and the movements of information and assisting others. Um, the data that we hold has a lot of value. Um, so, for example, uh, those in the manufacturing supply chains, uh, the proprietary and sensitive information can be stolen from within supply chains to allow other nations to get a head start, and some nation states sponsor that type of activity. So just touching on a few aspects of these groups, nothing happens without a reason. If you receive a spam email, it is because there is an individual behind the scenes that is looking to, um, to exploit you or your business, um, either for their, usually for their financial gain, um, or it could be, uh, as I say, with uh, hacktivists uh, or opportunists, it, it could be someone that, uh, a group that doesn't uh, like animal testing and that you work in a, an industry where animal testing is prevailing. So various reasons for things that can go wrong. So touching on this a little further, um, it's worth mentioning, I've used the word cyber a lot, however, cyber isn't really a word. Uh, it's a, a buzzword we use to encapsulate many different fields of risk. And the, the two broad ones that you should be aware of, uh, if you aren't already, are the fields of information security and data protection. Uh, again, if you're unfamiliar with the subject matters, these might sound incredibly similar or the same, the same thing, but I can assure you they're not. Um, information security, uh, tackling first, it's not legally mandated. It is the process of identifying and managing risks. So we would use measures um, at the bottom of the list here, you can see confidentiality, integrity, and availability. We would produce a risk register identifying what threats there are to the organization and we would ordinarily prioritize them using this matrix so confidentiality being um, how confidential is this information if, if i have a spreadsheet containing payroll information for staff we would give that a, a higher score than uh, a spreadsheet of um, newspaper subscriptions that we have integrity of information is uh, let's say we had the same spreadsheet of payroll information um, integrity is that information is accurate. Who has the ability to modify it? Um, potentially, so let's say there's the potential that someone could come along, uh, an individual internally or externally, and change the information in that, in that payroll data so that people are paid either more or less than they should be. So is there the potential that someone could modify it? And the third data point that would usually assess a threat against is availability. Uh, do you need access? Or, um, 
how dependent are we on access to that information? So it could be your email accounts, let, let's say uh, the service being your email account. Um, you might survive eight hours or a working day without access to your email. However, if you don't have access to your email for a week, things might start to get problematic. Um, so when we start assessing the principle of availability, it's um, how long can we survive without it? And then we can start assessing technical controls. So what redundancies do we need to have in place or how quickly do we need to resume service? On the other hand, we have data protection and this is, this is legally mandated. I'm sure most of you will be familiar with GDPR or have heard the mentions of it that are slowly quieting down due to the pandemic from a, from a couple of years ago when GDPR came into force. But this uh, pertains to processing of personal data, or that is information about individuals, uh, living individuals or European individuals, actually to be, to be specific, um, mandated by, by law um, and overseen by a regulation authority in the UK, which is the, the Information Commissioner's Office. It establishes monetary penalties if that information is used incorrectly um, in, uh, against the law or if an individual believes that, that you shouldn't be processing their data. Uh, but what I'd actually like to position for you thinking your thoughts is that the reputation from breach of data protection law, uh, the impact from the reputation damage can be far worse than actually the financial penalties once afforded. Uh, there was a case a couple of years ago, um, some of you may remember the Panama Papers, where a law firm, Mossack Fonseca, uh, was uh, suffered an incident, a journalist, a German journalist, uh, was able to extract uh, the confidential information from that law firm, uh, identifying many of the world's uh, wealthy elite uh, were engaging in tax avoidance um, and evasion practices. That information was disclosed uh, before any data protection authorities could actually look into it. The reputation damage led to the closure of the law firm. So from a professional services standpoint, uh, that is worth considering. So we have these two different fields. And just to, I suppose, put that into a quick summary, what we can say working through the body of the presentation so far is that an individual makes use of a computer device likely with access to information. They'll be in breach of either um, formal or informal guidance on information security or data protection. Uh, and that by not following those, those guidelines will result in financial loss or harm or legal issues or regulatory issues uh, and reputation damage. So those are the, the big three. There are other issues that can arise. So I've talked a lot about the background and, and hopefully for all of you, this is, this is making sense about where the problem is and that if you can see the trajectory, we, we haven't plateaued in technological innovation. Um, we will be in a very different world in, in 25 years, but that's another hour that I can talk about that I don't have time for today. But we can definitely say in 25 years, technology will have changed again. And the presentations on cyber issues, information security and data protection issues will have evolved further. This is a snapshot into this point in time of why we are where we are. So it's worth talking about then, what can we actually do about this? Very quickly, without a full risk assessment, and this is the most important part, ideally for all organizations, in approaching this, you need to identify the threats bespoke to your organization, as every organization is different. However, generically speaking, what we can say is there are some, some very common controls, some very basic bits of guidance that are applicable to 99% of organizations. And first of all, you need to be looking at governance. So you need to have appropriate policy in place in your organization that's governing passwords, that's governing acceptable use of email, acceptable use of company, um, um, using the web whilst on a company network about how what may be permitted to download. And there needs to be regularly advisories, reminders sent to staff to keep them aware of what, what their obligations are in being an employee of the organization and working with uh, information technology owned or operated by the business. Even if it's a personal device they use for personal purposes, and this is incredibly important, especially now, uh, whilst remote working, agile working is becoming now formalized uh, as we, I don't know where we are in the pandemic anymore, I'm not sure if anyone does, but we are um, likely to move to increasingly uh, incorporating remote working into our lives. So this type of guidance for who can use your work computers, if you have kids at home, then they might be uh, accidentally or without your knowing, interacting with a work device if it's been left unlocked. So we need to make people aware of what they can and cannot do. And that ties in very tightly with training. People need to be made aware of the importance of data and what can go wrong if that data is abused or access is gained uh, externally from an unauthorized party uh, or how to report incidents if they happen uh, so that people aren't afraid to put their hand up so that issues can be tackled. They need to be educated on what phishing is, when a phishing email comes through, um, how to spot them, 
uh, what malware is, malicious software, and then you're training on um, fundamentally the Data Protection Act, of course. But the most important point we need to establish through training really is, is paranoia. Um, we are, as a civilization, certainly in Great Britain, we're typically very trusting. And that's where the vast majority of these scams are coming through. Uh, there was an article on the BBC News just this morning of an individual that, that had received a telephone call claiming to be his bank and asking to transfer £6,000, which the gentleman did indeed do. However, if the gentleman had been a lot more paranoid and uh, questioned a lot deeper and uh, not necessarily known what to do exactly about it, simply being paranoid about it, then that issue could have been avoided. So we need to somehow find a way to make people, in a healthy way, paranoid. There are technical controls that we can implement to help us. And really the critical mix here is uh, software updates. Uh, software is updated all of the time. Uh, software is created by human beings. It is written by software engineers who are not infallible. There is always the potential that software can be compromised in some fashion. There is a concept called uh, uh, something called zero day exploits where software can be compromised and therefore greater parts of your computer or its operating system can be compromised. By simply updating your software regularly, either the operating system updates or even the anti antivirus itself, updating that software, you reduce the likelihood that malicious software can compromise your computer. And similarly, the next important point then is, is antivirus, what we still call antivirus or endpoint protection software. Uh, incredibly important, especially now, um, there are many ways that, that malware, malicious software can get onto your computer. Um, uh, worth saying, I appreciate I haven't said it. A virus is simply one type of malicious software. Uh, but you can get uh, malware on your computer from an email attached to uh, an email attachment by visiting a, a dodgy website. And actually, not just dodgy websites, um, there are a number of reports that highlight that actually um, religious websites, church websites in particular, uh, are used to push malware to visitors because the visitors to those religious websites are very trusting of their content uh, as part of their religion. This is again where trust is exploited. Um, so actually visiting a church website, you are more likely to end up downloading a malicious software package than if you were to visit a website that is more traditionally considered dodgy. <clears throat> a password manager uh, would be very useful. I appreciate, I'm sure many of you appreciate these days that we are increasingly using tens if not hundreds of different cloud services or devices that we need to log into and we're expected to Remember different passwords for each because with guidance being we shouldn't reuse the same password. Um, it'd be like using the same key to access your house and your car uh, or many cars and many houses. So we use different passwords. Um, using a password manager removes that. It, it does create a single point of failure. So you have a strong password to access your password manager, but uh, the, the a password manager is an incredible tool to use. That ties in with the next point, which is two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication is one-time passcodes to reduce the likelihood an unauthorized individual can access one of your, your accounts. So you, you end up with three bits of information to log in. You have a, an email address that is publicly known. Everyone knows your email address. You have a password that may be disclosed. Time back into the start of my presentation, I asked you to visit haveibeenown.com. And using that website, if it came up red, it may be that your password has been disclosed somewhere in a data breach when a, a service provider's uh, database was, was inadvertently accessed. So using two-factor authentication gives you a third piece, a, a, a passcode that changes typically every 30 or 60 seconds. And that way you need those three pieces of information to log in and therefore someone pretending to be you cannot log in. So it's worth doing. Uh, and is actually a requirement of most cyber insurance policies these days. A virtual private network or VPN is next. Um, this can help protect you against many scams. There are issues with remote working if you are passing through a train station or a coffee shop or an airport. So I appreciate that travel is reduced at the moment, but using public Wi-Fi does expose you to threats where your information can be intercepted, a type of threat called man in the middle, attacks where the information passing from your laptop to the internet can be intercepted. A virtual private network uh, vastly reduces the likelihood of that information being intercepted. And then we can start getting deeper, the concepts of vulnerability scans or penetration tests for actually testing your, your networks to see if there are other ways in. But as a whole, by following those basics, you can actually protect your organization to a, to a good degree. And it's actually worth mentioning here some way that we can help. Many of those controls are wrapped up in a scheme called Cyber Essentials operated by the British government um, under the National Cyber Security Centre. Um, and we actually provide a, 
a free online advice service. If you went to cyber-ami.com, your organization can access Cyber AMI free of charge. It will take you through a process to implement the government's guidance. Uh, that is what the government uh, prescribes as the minimum benchmark for uh, best practice in information security and reducing the likelihood of uh, many common cyber attacks uh, coming to fruition. So we have a free platform that will take you through a guided process um, and there is an official government certification uh, available at the end of that process um, if it's desired or needed as part of a contract. Uh, finally, wrapping up, just a quick note on other services that we provide within Radar. Um, our specialist solicitors and our cyber team uh, can advise you on most areas uh, pertaining to either data protection or information security, whether it's training, policy, uh, or if you've had an issue. Uh, if your business is uninsured and you require the benefits of legal privilege or instant response, uh, we can assist you. So, thank you very much. Um, it was a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but uh, hopefully that was of some use for you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, and uh, we've got a couple of questions that have been sent forward um, prior to this event and also a couple that have come up in the chat box. So what I'll do is we'll start with the questions that we had pre-discussed and then we'll have a look at the ones that have come up in the chat box. So the first one was, are there any post-Brexit threats to UK security? Uh Yes, it depends on how you look at the question. Uh, so post-Brexit threats, um, the first thing to look at there is the fact that it's a change. And change creates an opportunity that can be exploited by um, uh, an opportunist or by organised crime. So there are likely businesses, let's take the logistics sector, for example, where there is now a requirement for new paperwork. It's highly likely that can be exploited by an individual sending information, requesting paperwork that may expose transit routes of sensitive materials. Uh, so if I were to look to, um, I don't know, uh, depends on what a, a, a transport company is, is shipping, but I could actually find out what their manifests are and where they're going by pertaining to be asking for that information. And many people confused or not having received guidance could be exploited because of that. That's one angle of looking at the issue. And another way of looking at it is um, from a nation state perspective, there is very likely that we have a decreased information sharing between um, the UK and the EU. So our government probably has less insight into threats that are applicable. Uh, that's not to say it's entirely true, uh, but then the, our own government is unable to make us aware of issues that may be affecting us. So um, certainly there are risks there. Okay, thank you. And the second question that we got was, um, Emma was asking for advice on the use of cloud services rather than a hard drive for storage and what kind of security implications are there? Absolutely. Uh, so worth touching on there. So a cloud service, the, the best sentence on this is the cloud is simply someone else's computer. So it, what you are doing is in some sense, you are moving liability from yourself to maintain that computer security to another party. And when you're doing that, um, what's worth considering is that you've got the equivalent of a front door, which is your username and password and potentially two factor authentication, your keys to gain access to your account. And you've got the equivalent of the back door. So let's say you have a, I won't use a name here, so avoid liability myself, you have a cloud service provider that builds and maintains it. They, they build a CRM tool, they build some form of software. The builders, that that business that builds that software um, has a database or a system that they're using to store your information. And you should, well, you will need confidence that the, the practices they have in place themselves are uh, reducing the likelihood that's going to be accessed. Um, you can go on most businesses' website and look for their qualifications, I, I can see in the chat. There's lots of now mentions of ISO 27001 or the ISO 27000 series of Cyber Essentials Plus. There are various badges that can be obtained, um, which are useful, incredibly useful to evidence to an individual or to a business that you are taking the security of your system seriously and therefore they can be confident that they can store their data with you. So looking at the two bits, secure your own access to the account and then give yourself confidence that the, the organisation providing the service is treating your information securely and legally as well. And that ties really nicely into a question that we've just had through the chat box. Um, it, and it was the majority of our data services, so your CRMs, your websites, bulk mailing tools, are hosted by suppliers, as you've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. What kind of cyber insurance might we need? <laughs> um, I, I'm going to have to cater for this with I'm not an insurance professional, nor is this formally insurance advice, but uh, definitely speak to your insurance broker. However, there are uh, 
uh, a number of covers that are available now from a cyber, uh, cyber insurance perspective. Um, there is, uh, again, not providing financial advice, uh, a, an insurer called Complex, uh, Q-O-M-P-L-X, that will provide cover in the event that one of your suppliers mm -hmm. goes down or uh, becomes unavailable. So there's, uh, I think I've just seen those services mentioned actually, CRM. If your business is critically dependent, as soon as that service becomes available, the insurer will actually pay out. So you don't need to do anything, they'll trigger, trigger a claim on your behalf. The problem that you've got, of course, is that if your service is unavailable, you've then got the issue of you still need to have redundancies in, in place. So yes, you can get insurance for some aspects of the cost that you might incur, or potentially increased cost of working under a fuller uh, proper cyber insurance policy. However, from a, a business resilience standpoint or um, uh, instant response, you need to know what your backup services are and how quickly you can switch to them in the event that a main supplier goes down. Thank you, thank you for that. Now, we've also got a question from Mark and he said, in your opinion, what is the most important skill to possess in order to thrive in cybersecurity? <laughs> um, my personal opinion on that question would be paranoia. Uh, you cannot be paranoid enough. And if you can approach security with that mindset and evaluate every single thing that you are doing through, through the eyes of it potentially being exploited by any type of individual, and as, as paranoid as you can get any type of individual, whether it be your partner, your child, they're all out to get you, just take that mindset, then you can figure out the technical means or the, the governance means to reduce that threat. But just being constantly paranoid is the best security skill available. Thank you. Now, um, Leopold has made mention to um, looking at Cyber Essentials Plus for um, contractual requirements, which is quite a common thing nowadays when it comes down to bidding for public contracts or private contracts. Um, and he's he stated, I'm currently looking at Cyber Essentials Plus and as well as giving a handy list of things to do and have a third party check it over, our biggest driver is that we need to hold it for certain contracts. So what kind of advice can you give people that are in that position? Um, trying to understand the, the question within there. Uh, so Cyber Essentials Plus, if it's required um, in order to tender or bid, then it's just something that you have to go and do. Uh, and Cyber Essentials Plus has a um, uh, an audit requirement at the end of it. So what you are actually declaring in the cyber essential self-assessment um, and that is picked up through the vulnerability scan, if there are any um, uh, areas of improvement, they will need to be fixed before you're awarded that certificate. Uh, the best thing to do is uh, to shop around for your suppliers, have a chat with a number of businesses that you're happy to work with as it's um, an interesting marketplace. So yeah, find someone you're comfortable working with if you need to go to cyber essentials, please. Thank you. And um, with regards to Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus, um, can you just tell us a little bit about the requirements when it comes down to having a hard, um, a, either um, a, using a software service or having an a infrastructure, which is a physical infrastructure? Uh, so is that pertaining to the scope of the scheme? Yes, yeah. Okay, uh, so the, the general rule of thumb for the scope of cyber essentials is um, determining whether or not something falls within scope is, is it within the boundary of your computer network in the office, in your office environment? Uh, and this is, uh, the pandemic has made that slightly interesting as many people are now remote workers, so that needs factoring in, so their home routers suddenly come into play. Um, or does the service, uh, do you have control of the operating system? So for example, uh, you, uh, your business might make use of Amazon Web Services, uh, and if you use that, you might have a virtual server in the cloud. If you control the, the operating system on that server, that also falls within scope. Um, so you would need to maintain those devices. That's the, the basic rule of thumb, but uh, it, it varies based on what your organization does, what your infrastructure is. If you follow those rules, it's fairly straightforward. Right, okay, thank you very much. And we will be touching on some of these things in a little bit more detail when it comes down to the second part of the series, which will be on October the 19th. Um, and that's the last question. And thank you very much for coming along, Aaron, and um, sit, talking us through. You, you gave us some interesting tips. Before we do move on to that, though, we did have a, a request on those tasks that you set. How can people become more secure with those tasks that you've set? So what do they need to change? Okay, um, so jumping back to those, the, the first test was uh, website. 
Um, so worth touching on there. If your website scored less than an A, and it was built by a marketing agency, uh, built recently by a marketing agency, you should go back to that marketing agency and ask them why they've provided you with a website that's creating security vulnerabilities for you. If you don't have a contract in place with your web design agency, you need to ask them for one so you can make sure the liability is clear. Um, so that, that's the first point. If you build the website yourself, then the, the service that you have used will tell you where it is deficient. Uh, and it's relatively straightforward to figure out. That's not all threats by any stretch of the imagination. It's just something that are quickly, easily to do as an online test. The second point was um, iPhones. So whether or not to set your iPhone to green or gray. So uh, the, if you toggle it to green, your iPhone after 10 incorrect passcode attempts will delete all of your data. Uh, I did see a comment flash through that someone had children and what if the children are inquisitive? And the point there is that it's not permanently deleted, it is just deleted from the device. Your information will still most likely be backed up to iCloud. So what you do is, your um, after 10 correct attempts, incorrect attempts, your device will be wiped. You can then uh, plug, put your phone on charge, put your iCloud details into the phone, and within half an hour, all of your information will be back. The crux of the issue is that if someone you don't want to gain access to your phone, if it's lost or stolen for whatever reason, and someone tries to gain access that really shouldn't have access to it, then you have deprived them the ability to potentially access company networks, company data, emails. If someone gains access to your email accounts on your phone, they can send emails pretending to be you. That can just spiral. So setting it green is just infinitely sensible. And the third test was, have I been owned? The real importance of that test is showing that most people's information is now not private. We, we don't own it anymore. And any, anywhere that we create a, pass, a password to access a service, if you don't have two-factor authentication, you are at risk because your password can be disclosed. And if you reuse the password, someone just needs your email address and that password, and they can try lots of different websites to log in and eventually will likely gain access to one of your accounts. That website simply exposes the fact that that's probably, uh, probably already happened. If it's red, it's probably already happened. If it's green, it doesn't mean you're in the clear. It just means that service hasn't yet picked up whether or not your information is publicly available online. Uh, so the best thing to do is always use different passwords for every website If you're on, uh, and use a complex password. Uh, if that's too challenging, if you have too many services, use a password manager um, and always make use of two-factor authentication. And if you can follow that basic guidance, you've reduced the likelihood of someone being able to log into your account and do things pretending to be you with your authority. Again, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Erin. Okay, now we've come toward the end and I'm just going to hand back over to Claire. Brilliant. Thank you so much both. Uh, that was really, really interesting. Um, so that's it for today's session. Thank you to everyone who joined us and thanks again to Erin and Kirsty for your insights and expertise. Um, don't forget, if you're a member of CMI, log into Management Direct using the link in the live chat where you can find a range of practical development resources and much more. If you're not yet a member or subscriber, join our community via the link also in the chat to gain access to the Management Direct portal, uh, where you can also sign up for the free CMI newsletter. Um, as Kirsty mentioned, don't forget to join us on the 19th of October for the next cybersecurity event. Again, the, the link is in the chat and will be in the follow up email um, for those of you who book to attend. Um, and we'd also appreciate your feedback on today's event. So again, the link is in the chat for you to complete the form um, to be entered into a draw to receive a CMI goodie bag. Um, so thanks again, um, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day.